Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. As always, I'm Billy. I got my man's Dame here with me, and we have a lot to cover. Last episode was our free agency preview. Now a few days of free agency have, has passed, and we're going to go ahead and, and grade most of the teams for agencies. A lot of the teams were um, active, but there were a few that were pretty quiet, didn't have too many moves, so we'll try to hit on as many relevant teams as we can. Um, but on top of free agency, I know we said neither of us thought it would ever happen, but the divorce in Portland is finally taking place. Damian Lillard went ahead and requested a trade, so we're going to go ahead and get into all of that. But first, how are we doing today, Dame? I'm doing great, man. I'm doing great. I'm ready to talk about these free agency moves. Uh, there, was, there was one team out there that had a great free agency. We ain't gonna we ain't gonna get into them yet, but there was one team that had a, a fantastic free agency, in my opinion. Yeah, some of these teams came away with some some steals, uh, to right. say the least. Some teams it was some bad some deals steals. too. It was some questionable deals out there. Some D minuses and some F's to give out today. So 100. percent before we get into all that, going to get the, the housekeeping out of the way. As always, if you are watching on YouTube, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. Um, follow both of the socials you see below at Off The Glass Pod on Instagram and at Off The Glass Podcast on TikTok. Posting shorts up there daily. We appreciate the support as always. We're closing in on 100 followers on Instagram, so be sure to, to follow the channel there and follow the TikTok as well. Um, if you're listening on audio platforms, Apple Podcasts or Spotify, go ahead and drop a five star review and, and set the show to pre download to your phone or mobile device as well. Without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get right into it. We thought James Harden putting in his trade request might have been the biggest domino for agency. And Damian Lillard said, hold my beer. <laughs> After, was it 12, 13 seasons there in Portland? Mm hmm. The most loyal guy in the NBA, hands down, is officially requesting a trade from the Pacific Northwest, and he will be moving on from the Portland Trailblazers. All in, all signs are indicating that the Trailblazers are going to fulfill that request. It's been mixed reports whether they're going to fulfill his request in terms of what team he would like to go to. The mm -hmm. top two suitors there being Miami, who is, um, according to reports from Chris Haynes, who is the guy to go to for news on Damian Lillard saying that Miami is his top preferred destination. Brooklyn also being a team that he mentioned potentially wanting to play for as well. Um, but the Trailblazers have reports have come out that they're mostly going to do whatever they feel is in the best interest for their franchise. And so it'll be interesting to see whether they, you know, fulfill his wish and get him to Miami or Brooklyn or send him off somewhere else to a team that has the draft capital that Portland may be looking for, like Utah. <laughs> Um, so uh, off the bat what was your reaction to seeing the news finally come out that Damian Lillard is requesting a trade from Portland about time <laughs> like <laughs> about damn time like Jesus Christ bro we've been talking about this for the past I don't know how many off seasons um, I feel like every off season there's the okay is Dame gonna ask out is Dame gonna ask for a trade are they finally gonna trade Dame it's like and I think this off season was finally the time it kind of forced their hand a little bit like you, you got the number three overall pick scoop failed you at three um hornets obviously passed up on him so you got school you got your point guard of the future you got anthony simon shaden sharp it's like you have the pieces already and you didn't even trade the superstar yet so it was just it it, it just made sense it made sense for dame it made sense for both parties basically mm -hmm. dame wants to win the championship you're not going to win a championship in portland they have the pieces to rebuild. It just makes too much sense to to, to trade Damian Lillard. So, finally, finally, he's going to get traded, hopefully to a team that he can contend. He can actually win a championship. So, I'm excited. I'm excited to see where he goes. I'm curious to see if, like you said, the Trailblazers are going to are gonna just send him to Miami because the reports are making it seem like he, it's Miami or bust. That's what he mm -hmm. said. So, I'm, I'm curious to see... If they get a better deal out there, would they trade him somewhere else? No, I don't. I don't think they're gonna do him dirty, like trade him to like Utah. Like I don't think they're gonna trade him to a, a terrible team, or at least not a contending team, but a team like Brooklyn, a team like Miami, obviously, a team like Philly, um, uh, a team like like Boston. That's what I meant to say. Boston. Yeah. That's interesting. Even though he didn't, he said he didn't want to play for Boston. I'm curious to see if they actually do the, the Jalen Brown deal, throw him in there. I'm curious to see if they would really send him to Boston, even though that's a place he said he didn't want to go. Yeah, the Heat are, or not the Heat, the, the Blazers are in an interesting spot. 
uh, Adrian Wojnarowski, Wojnarowski reported as well that the Blazers were not particularly impressed by the initial offers that the Heat threw together, um, which he said may force their hand to can seriously consider some of those other destinations that you mentioned. Because regardless of whether he's the, the team's top preferred, des- top preferred destination or not, you're going to put in a trade re- offer for Damian Lillard. 100%. You, anything you can do to enter that sweepstakes. He's one of the 75 greatest players ever. Um, we know what he's been able to do with, albeit a, a pretty subpar roster a lot of years there in Portland. Um, and it's very evident that he wants to win a ring. And so he, you're going to be getting the best of Damian Lillard for, you know, whatever, the next four or five years um, to whatever team he goes to next. So it makes a ton of sense for as many teams as possible to want to get in on the sweepstakes, regardless of what, you know, the reports are that's coming out. Um, also want to note good on Portland fans. I feel like I've seen nothing but, you know, love and support from them um, for Dame, which is good. I don't want to see nobody turn their back because, again, he could have left – years ago at this point. should have left years ago <laughs> actually he should have left years ago uh, yeah so good to see that everybody's just you know appreciative of what he's done for the city obviously the franchise all team all-time leading scorer i think in both of our eyes the greatest trailblazer ever so um a big shift coming ahead for their franchise and at a, a very pivotal point in time with summer league starting later this week in, in vegas so gonna get to see the potential new face of the franchise there in scoot henderson um, play his first games there in a Trailblazer uniform. So I'm really interested to see how this all plays out because I really like the fit in Miami. I really like the fit in uh, Boston as well. If they're able to get that done. I like the fit um, in Philly as well, if they're able to find a way to get, to get a deal done for him. Um, but it's hard because he wants to play with the stars that are on all of those teams. And the Trailblazers are expecting a star in return in any of those deals. So if he's trying to go to Miami, Miami is not going to give up Jimmy or Bam. And that's going to be no. one of the two players that Portland would like back in that deal, even though I don't think it really makes sense to get a guy like Jimmy potentially. But if you could pull back Bam from an organizational standpoint, that makes sense. But Lillard would like to play with the both of them. So exactly, um, it's going to be interesting how this all plays out. Um, People have kind of speculated that Portland is going to, at the end of the day, grant him his wish of going to to Miami um, just because of all the years they spent together, how loyal he was to that, that organization, how much he just means to the city of Portland. Um, some people feel like it'd be a bad look on them to, to ship him out somewhere um, where he clearly didn't want to go. Um, and there's even been rumors speculating that he potentially is going, his agent is going around and telling other teams, if you make a trade for Dame, we're not playing for you. If you're not Miami, if you're not. That's Oakland. crazy. That's kind of wild because like there's some teams out there that if he went to, they're good. Con- they're a, a good contender. They're not stacked teams. Like that's 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 kind of crazy how it's Miami or bust. Because like you said, the Philly fit is a good fit. Like him and Joel Embiid would be just dis- a disgusting duo. Right. The Boston fit him Tatum, and then you got Przingis too, and you still have quality role players around you. Like. Like there's some good teams out there. Like I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, I get it. I think Miami it would be the best team for him to go to just because they have solid defender, elite defenders around him basically, mm-hmm. and he can be that number one guy scoring wise on that team. Like if he goes to Boston, Tatum is there. If he goes to Joel Embiid, Joel Embiid is like still kind of the first option. So, um, I, I so part of me thinks that he wants to go to a team where he is the number one scoring option or he is at least viewed as like the guy offensively like if he goes to Mm -hmm. miami you know you people could say jimmy is better that's fine but offensively lillard would be the number one option offensively lillard would be the one taking that final shot just because he's the better scorer like he's a better offensive player so i don't i think that is playing a part in it a little bit yeah potentially i uh I also think with the Philly fit, immediately you think Maxi has to be a part of that deal. But if I'm Portland, I don't know that I really want Tyrese Maxi, not from a talent perspective, but you would create such a log jam at your guard position. You already have Anthony, you just drafted Scoot. You know, Shade Sharp can play more of the three, but 
there would really be no way to have these four guys on the court at the same time with Anthony, Scoot, Shaden, and then potentially trying to bring in a guy like Tyrese Maxey. So I think for him to even get to somewhere like Philly, you're probably going to have to bring in a third team of some sort um, and really make it a larger deal and move pieces around a lot of different ways. Um, so it, very, very, very interesting days ahead for Portland um, because – the deal that they could get back for Miami is likely going to be centered around a package, including Tyler Hero, which I think you could fit in the same line of thinking with Tyrese Maxey. He's like, why mm-hmm. would we want to bring in Tyler Hero? Like, unless their then potential move from there is we bring in Tyler Hero and then move off of Simons when he has pretty good trade value as well. And then you're building around Scoot, Hero, Shane and Sharp, and just kind of go from there with, you know, other young pieces or draft assets that you get from potentially trading away Simon. So potentially that's a route they can go down. But, um, yeah, I'm really interested to see how this all is going to play out for for Portland. Um, it took him a couple of days after free agency started to request this trade, which I think is going to be a perfect segue right into these free agency grades because while he still was supposedly committed to, to staying in Portland, they went out and re-signed his guy, Jeremy Grant, to a massive contract, five years, $160 million for Jeremy Grant. That's and a bad tra- deal. I'm sorry. Tra- I didn't mean to cut you off. That's a bad <laughs> deal, bro. I'm sorry. Yeah, the Trailblazers have said that they, even with the trade request, would, would have signed Jeremy Grant to this deal, which I don't know about that. $32 million a year is, is steep for, for a guy like Jeremy Grant. I think it's deserved, deserved in air quotes, because um, he's definitely been a guy that's continued to improve throughout his his multiple stops in the league, um, going from Denver to Detroit, um, and now with his time in Portland, putting up almost 21 points a night, and really has grown from a you know energy guy, a defensive guy, to being a legitimate scoring option, um, and, and could be a very good piece on a contending team. They just aren't that in Portland right now, so. Um, yeah, I agree with you, especially with the fact that obviously with Damian Lillard requesting the trade, Jeremy Grant does not really fit the timeline there in Portland, but he's now locked up for five years. Um, that's the crazy part, man. Yeah. Five years is a long time. Like, that's why, like, this contract, it's like damn near untradeable, bro. Like, who's going to gonna want this contract? You who, would likely have to. This? Yeah, you'd likely have to come off of some draft capital to get that moved, um, to get it to a team that could, you know, kind of absorb that salary. Um, so yeah, for and this is really the, the only move that the Trailblazers has made all of free agency. Um, yeah, I got to give it like a, a D. I, this to be ah, that's as an F, bro. I'm sorry. It's just, <laughs> this trade is an F for me, bro. Five years, it's a lot of money, and it's for just so long. You're locked into this contract for so long, bro. Yep. And and with, the, like, the new CBA, all these rules, other teams are not going to want to take on this contract. Yeah. Like, because yeah. why am I going to go that far over the, the second apron for Jeremy Grant? No no disrespect. He's a good player, but it's like, for that much money, for that long, I'm not going to I'm not gonna handicap my team for Jeremy Grant. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I think, I think they're being a little. They don't want to come out and say that they very clearly signed Jeremy Grant in hopes to keep Dame there. Right. But that's what I'm pretty sure happened, right? Like, there's if you knew going into it that Damian Lillard was going to leave, you would not have re-signed Jeremy Grant. It just makes more sense for to have let him walk into free agency. He would not have gotten this type of deal, I imagine, from. Um, other teams. And I don't, again, I don't want to say that any of this is us trying to knock on Jeremy Grant as a player. Um, I think he's a very, very good player. And I think he deserves to get a bag, maybe just not this big of a bag in Portland. Um, so again, all of this is going to be viewed through that lens for on a team by team basis and judging their specific circumstances. So with all that in mind, I gave it a D, you gave it an F. I think F could very well be warranted because Again, you just you just lost a, a good chunk of your cap flexibility here for the next few years. And then, like I said, to move off of this contract, potentially 
teams are probably going to want a first round pick or first and a second, some type of draft capital to, to incentivize them bringing on this type of contract. So, um, yeah, not a, a huge, huge fan of that signing. Um, I'm going to pivot over to another team now who I think may have made the most signings uh, in mm-hmm. free agency and just were giving out <clears throat> super, super small contracts. And it's a team that we've talked about here for a while now who, after trading for Bradley Beal, we both still had a lot of questions about how they're going to fill out their roster and what they're going to do with DeAndre Ayton potentially. And with the Phoenix Suns, for as as handicapped as they were with their salary cap and just the how much money they're shelling out to their top four guys, they had a very, very good free agency window. Again, obviously bringing in Bradley Beal, Jordan Goodwin, and Isaiah Todd um, in that three-team three trade there with the Wizards and the Pacers. They also bring in Kata Bates Diop on a two-year deal, who was almost a 40% shooter from three last year with San Antonio, um, and, a, and a good wing defender as well. They bring in Drew Eubanks. They bring in Eric Gordon as well to be a, a bench piece for them, and it can really be a microwave off the bench there in Phoenix. Damian Lee comes back. They bring in Chemezi Metu. Josh Kogi is able to come back, which is huge for them because they did lose Torrey Craig. Um, and they also bring in Yuta Watanabe, who for a point in time during the season last year was one of the best three-point shooters in the league um, there in Brooklyn. So, look, as critical as I have been of Phoenix for how they've constructed this roster, I'm going to give credit where credit is due. This is like a, a B plus, maybe an A minus free agency window, really, when you consider their circumstances. Um with how tight their money was. And they were able to bring in, I think a lot of guys who can space the floor, can shoot the ball and can play defense, which is their biggest issue, right? Perimeter defense was their biggest issue going into this free agency period and bringing back a Kogi while also bringing in guys like Kata base Diop and Yuta, I think is huge, huge pickups for them. And it gives them some flexibility to try to figure out what that, you know, maybe, eight man rotation is going to be nine man rotation is going to be come playoff time when you look to make that push yeah 100 percent um like you said for the money that they had i'm gonna be honest i was shocked that they actually had this good of a free agency now obviously the names on here aren't like they don't jump out at you but for the team that they have and for the amount of money that they have they did a really 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 good job like a lot of these guys not a lot. All these guys, they just, they just need to play their role. Like the team revolves around their big three, big ish four, I guess. If you want to count DeAndre Ayton. So, I mean, as long as those big three can stay healthy, these are all guys that can contribute and then just play your role. That's all we need you to do. Just come on this team, play your role. We don't need we don't need huge things out of you. That's what we have our stars for. So, um, with all that being said, honestly, I was I'm giving them an A, just because yeah. just. For, like you said, for their circumstances, for the little amount of money that they had to bring in a lot of these guys. And a lot of people did say that some uh, older role players would want to play for the Suns, even for less money, just to get have a, champ, have a chance at a championship. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, I, I, I saw that a little bit, but I didn't think with the, the little amount of money that they had that a lot of people would really do that. I love the Eric Gordon signing. Like he yep. said, he turned down multiple teams for more with le- for less money to play with the Suns. So that was huge for them. Like you said, a lot of these guys just they're and they're exactly what this team needs. They have they got three point shooting and that they got people who can play a little bit of defense. That's really all they need. Now as a as a whole, this team as a whole, they're not gonna be the best defensive team, but they have so much firepower that if if their guys, their main core stays healthy, the Suns are very, very scary. Very yep. scary. I, I'm not going to lie. So, like I said, I, I definitely give them an A for this free agency. Yeah, I, I don't know what more I think they could have done, really. Right. Um, again, given their, their circumstances. So, they have built out their roster very nicely. And still, again, the option of trading Aiton is on the table. Mm-hmm. Um, but... You know, you bring in a new coach, he obviously had butted heads with Monty William in the past, so maybe Vogel could kind of, you know, have a better relationship there and get him to buy back in. Um, and like you said, 
with that top end talent, now you bring in great three and D guys around them. They're very dangerous. They are very dangerous. The Bradley Beal trade is significantly better because of this free agency period. Um, right. Because now not only are they top heavy, but they've kind of got some depth. They've got the depth. They've got some defenders. Um, so this is a, a – I literally, like I said, I don't think I could have thought of a better, better free agency window for Phoenix. So they are going all in, um, and they're doing it. Very, very nicely. So they're going to be a, a massive threat, not only in the West to teams like Denver, L.A., but just in general for the, the championship as a, a title contender. 100%. Um, we're going to pivot now to another team um, that, that made a ton of moves. Um, we're going to go ahead and get them out of the way early because I know you got a lot to say about your Lakers. Um, biggest, biggest signings here. Brought back Austin Reeves on a four-year deal. And honestly, I think even less than I think people may have been expecting, getting him on a four-year $56 million deal, um, potentially just because of how much money got dished out early. He just – there weren't as many suitors for him as a restricted free agent. The money wasn't as good as it may have been, and he can come back with, with L.A. where, you know – what it's worth being in LA, you know, he's got the signature shoe now. He's getting the fame. If he wants any of that, that's the place to be for. So that is a huge, huge retaining for the Lakers. In addition to bringing back Rui on a three-year deal, they get Torian Prince on an absolute steal of a deal. I think it's one year, four and a half million dollars. Um, you know, any type of three and D guys are going to be some of the most sought after in free agency, like we just talked about with the Suns. So that's a huge pickup there. Um, you bring back D'Lo on a two-year deal. You lose Dennis Schroeder to Toronto, but you bring in Gabe Vincent on a three-year, what is it, uh, 33, $33 million. million. Yeah, so bringing him in on $11 million a year, obviously just coming off of a finals run, starting for the Eastern Conference champion Miami Heat, and just low-key also bringing in Jackson Hayes on a two-year deal, um, who I think could, again – provide just a bigger body option there. Um, again, obviously having lost Thomas Bryant, um, you know, last season in a trade to the Nuggets, um, bringing in another center there. So potentially given the option to maybe move AD to the four for some minutes um, there during the season. But looking at their free agency as a whole, as a Lakers fan, what would you grade their free agency window? I got to grade it an A plus, bro. Come on. I listen, I got to grade it an A plus cuz we ran the team back with multiple quality additions, all right? So look, I'm I'm fine with bringing D'Lo back just because we have Gabe Vincent as well mm -hmm. on a, on a good deal. So that means D'Angelo Russell is a good player, all right? I know the playoffs, the last playoff series kind of like messed up people's uh, opinions on him. And in his playoff struggles as a whole throughout his career, he's he had some bad series, so I'm, I'm not going to lie. But we're going to have D'Lo throughout the season. D'Lo's going to be a quality for us. He's going to be good. He's going to provide scoring. He's going he's gonna to do a lot for us. And then push come to shove, say we get in that situation in the playoffs where his shot's not falling. He doesn't really provide defense. So, like, when his shot's not falling, he's not really giving us much out there. That's where Gabe Vincent comes in. Gabe Vincent is proven that he will not fold in the biggest moment. He'll provide good shooting. He'll provide good playmaking and solid defense. So I absolutely love the Gabe Vincent signing because it just helped out the D'Lo re-signing. So I'm fine with that. Um, I like Jackson Hayes. I think he's a he's an athletic big that can run the floor. I think he'll, he'll be really, really good. That was an underrated pickup because I always said I feel like the Lakers just needed another big man. They, I still feel like we could still add one more. Um, this doesn't have to be a huge name, big man, just for just for depth purposes. So I like that pickup a lot. Torian Prince, three and D on that type of deal is amazing. It's an amazing pickup. Low key Cam Reddish. Listen, I'm still holding out hope because I always listen. Cam Reddish always shows flashes, man. I've always said yeah. he just needs an opportunity. Now, I don't know how much of an opportunity he's going to get with the Lakers. I'm going to be honest, but I just hope that he can continue to develop and continue to reach that potential that people thought he had um, coming into the league. So Rui Hachimura, love bringing him back. I feel like he's only going to get better, um, especially working with Phil Handy. I feel like that shot's only going to get better. His offensive game is only going to improve. So love that. And my man, Austin Reeves, man, that was a steal of a deal. Like, bro, we were talking about we would have matched anything up to 100 M's 
And yeah. we got him for four yeah. years, yeah. $54 million. He's getting paid less than Dylan Brooks yearly. That is crazy. That's, bro, that's a, that's a great deal. That is a great deal. So I've talked about it before. Um, I think we won free agency. I think it was an A-plus a a plus free agency. I think that we did the right thing in not panicking and making a huge move, trading all our debt for Kyrie Irving or trying to trade for Bradley Beal. Like, do anything that would completely make us so top-heavy to the point where if one of our stars gets hurt, we're completely done. So I, th I feel like we're a balanced team. We have depth. We got a little bit of shooting. We got good defense. Listen, we can go on a run. We can definitely go on a run. We're still going to have some problems with the teams like the Suns and the Nuggets, but I feel like we're at a point where those are the best three teams in the West, and they can all compete. Like, I don't feel like we're at a super notch below any one of those other two teams. Yeah, no, look, I think they probably did have the best free agency window. Um, you bring back all of the most important guys. Really, the, the only key loss there is, is – uh, like we said, Schroeder, but you essentially replace that with Gabe Vincent, um, who can play as a good point of attack defender on defense. Um, again, can be a primary ball handler at times. That we saw from him in Miami. Big shot maker, great floor spacer, like fits exactly what you would want out of your point guard. And again, that also then gives you the opportunity to bring back D'Lo and have even less pressure on him than he did from this past year. Um, bringing in Cam Reddish on a kind of a flyer deal as well. Um, that's huge. Like you said, I think he's always shown flashes. I feel like this may be his last real shot in the league because you then eventually kind of rack up the reputation of it didn't, it doesn't work out one place. Okay. Maybe it's fit, but you go two, three, four teams and you just can't, can't get it to work. Mm -hmm. You know, teams won't be as likely to want to give you the opportunity. So, um, look, I believe in him. I think the talent is there. Um, I think, you know, potentially if they can get him to buy in a little bit on the defensive side of the ball, do some of the little things, um, and then continue to showcase his shot-making ability um, on the Lakers. He may carve out a small role there um, in L.A., but, again, bringing back Austin Reeves, bringing back D'Lo, you bring in Gabe Vincent, get Torian Prince on a steal, Bring back Rui. You get Jackson Hayes. That's a that's an A. That's an A. You could not have asked for a better free agency. I think if you're the Lakers, I think the team is very deep. I think they have great defensive options, not just from the perimeter, but also from an interior perspective. Jackson Hayes, I think, is a very good rim protector. Um, and I think you play him and AD together. Um, I think that could potentially be good. You bring back more size, like we said, in Rui. So uh, look. The Lakers may have ran away with free agency here. Them and the Suns, I think, had some of the most impressive windows given their circumstances and how many options they were able to bring in just with the not having, you know, like the 60 M's in, in cap space like a team like the Rockies did. So, yeah, A, a for the Lakers. <sighs> about to come out the West, man. We're about to come out the West. We're about to win Title 18. Ah, can't wait. Start the season tomorrow. Start it up, bro. I'm ready. Let's go. Um, let's keep, let's keep it in the West. Let's keep it in the West. Um, we're going to go over to the team that had the most cap space here in free agency um, with the Houston Rockets. Um, four signings for them, taking up most of that cap space and really pretty much between two of them. The first one being the biggest which was Fred Van Vliet, who signed a three-year, $130 million deal from the Rockets, which is that's a lot of money. $43 million a year is a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But, again, like we said last episode in the, in the free agency preview, A, they have to spend it, and B, you just don't want to bring in guys for massive long-term deals. This is a three-year deal, but it's really a two-on-one. Because there is a team option there on that on that third year, so I think that fits in great. I think he'll fit in good with the the, the Rockets' young core. They also bring in Dylan Brooks on a four-year, eighty million dollar deal. Um, I think he'll fit in great. You know, jokes aside, like at the end of the day, he is an All Defensive Team player. He will probably rack up a couple of more of those throughout his career and throughout his time in Houston. Um, to be a very capable wing defender for them. They got to cut the shot diet down. He cannot have the same green light like he had in Memphis. 
Um, but, you know, two threes a game, maybe three threes a game, I think is a good place for him to live. Um, not six or seven a night, um, especially if you don't have it going. Like, right. We got we to gotta cut that off. Right. Um, but Purley, from a defensive perspective, he's going to give you the energy. He's going to give you the, the hustle. He's going to be a pest. He's going to be a nuisance for whatever team you're playing that night. Dylan Brooks is one of the type of guys that you hate to play against but love to have on your team. So that's a good pickup there for the Rockets as well. Um, and then they also bring in Jeff Green on a one-year deal. Um, so, again, another great veteran presence, now an NBA champion. Um, just can get in the ears of those guys on the on the Rockets and make sure that they're doing things the right way. And also bring in Jock Landale on a four-year deal who, you know, in all honesty, outplayed Aiton in a lot of respects um, in that playoff series against Denver this past year with Phoenix. So, um, you know, potentially bringing in a big body that gives them some flexibility to maybe spend more time playing Shingun at the, the four um and you know take some responsibilities off of him on the defensive side of the ball um which is you know some of his weaker areas of his game so um all in all i would give this rockets for agency period a a b i think a b sounds good like i said i think it was gonna be really hard for them to mess this up i think people are really big on the numbers for the the fred van fleet contract a lot of people think it's a crazy overpay but like i said they have to spend the money i think that he fits I think that having the two, two plus one deal structure is great. So if two years from now they want to kind of wipe their hands clean and, and not pick up the team option, he becomes an unrestricted free agent from there. Um, same thing even with the Dylan Brooks deal. Look, $20 million a year. Some people think it's an overpay. I think, again, he's an all-defensive type of guy. I think we've gone too far on the jokes and stuff about, you know, he's still a very good NBA player. He was never going to go – <laughs> like go and play in China, right? Right. <laughs> if he wasn't going to sign with Houston, someone else was going to sign Dylan Brooks. So um, I still think, you know, four-year, $80 million is a, a decent contract. And, um, you know, if that team gets better, he could just continue to be a complimentary defender um, for that team. And so they still have that flexibility there in the next few years. Um, and all the guys that they brought in, I don't think, most importantly, are going to hinder that young core's development. If anything, they can just continue to complement them, um, you know, spacing the floor um, and you bring in some vets as well in Jeff Green. So, yeah, I think a B for Houston is good. I think this was a very good free agency period for them. 100%. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people are just too focused on the numbers and too focused on the fact that they view Dylan Brooks in this light, that he's really just this bum, like, they're like, oh, my God, I can't believe Dylan Brooks is getting paid $20 million. First of all, $20 million a year it, in today's NBA is not, not as crazy as you think it is. It's really not not mm -hmm. nowadays. So I, I thought the deal was fine. You know what I mean? Like, I, I think, like you said, the Fred Van Vliet one, it is a lot of money yearly. But the fact that, worst case scenario, it can it could be a two-year contract, I think it's fine. Like, mm -hmm. you ha like you said, you, they, they missed out on Harden. Or, or I believe they said they didn't want Harden. I forgot what happened with that situation. But long story short, they didn't bring in Harden. They didn't get Brook Lopez. Um, they didn't get a guy like Kuzma. Like they they were all those like top end guys. I mean they were gone, and they have to spend the money somewhere. So I'm not mad at the Fred Van Vliet signing. I'm really not. I know it's a lot of money, but like we talked about, it could be two years at worst. So mm -hmm. that one, um, Dylan Brooks, like I said, 20 M's a year is not that bad. It's really not, and yep. he really fits with that team. The only thing is, like you said, he needs to cut down on the shots. But I think under Ime Udoka, I, th I feel like he can get that guy to really just lock into his role and just be a defensive stopper. We yep. need you to be come out here, be gritty, be tough, play defense, be a pest, um, frustrate the other team's best player. Like, if you can just do that and don't focus on shooting six, seven threes a game like you did in Memphis, like, I think he'll be fine. I think the structure in Memphis... Honestly, I don't think there was structure in Memphis. I feel like a lot of those guys in Memphis kind of just did whatever they want. And clearly we can see with the Josh situation, with the Dylan Brooks situation before. So I feel like when he actually goes to a real team with um, with a head coach that can give him the buy-in, just on the defensive end more to, to hone in on those abilities, I feel like he'll be fine. So I like those two signings. I really don't feel like it was that bad. Jeff Green, I feel like, is a really underrated signing because that team we talked about it last year was an AAU team. Like, they did whatever they want. They looked terrible, 
They had no structure. They were, like, doing whatever, and they had zero veterans on that team. So bringing a guy like Jeff Green, who's been around the league, been on multiple teams, been around superstars, like you said, won a championship, Mm -hmm. I think that's a really, really, really good signing for them. So um, if I had to give them a grade, I would say, I'd say, yeah, I think a B sounds right. I think a B sounds right because it is a lot of money still, but I feel like you had to spend the money. And the guys that they brought in just are guys that fit well with that team. So, yeah, I give them a B. I'm not going to lie. I think I want to actually go up to a B plus. Like, I think the fit with Fred and Dylan is really good. I think they're not going to take the ball out of too long out of the hands of their their guys and Jalen Green. Um, I think that also gives you the, the opportunity to have a man come off the bench, like, and not have to force him into this big role. And if he can handle more, then great. Um, but it gives you the flexibility. I think the Jock Landale signing is actually really good, like I said, because it gives you some flexibility to potentially play Shangun at the four at times. So I give it a B plus. I really do think that all of those pieces fit well around their young core. Um, and that had to be the number one focus is like you cannot, cannot, cannot bring in people that are going to hinder this development. You just need complementary pieces to continue to go through this timeline. Um, I think they were able to do that. Um, now they did make a trade and let me pull up the details here. Um, which is, um, I think to me, not a, uh, not the best move. I feel like they kind of gave up on some guys. Um, obviously in a couple of different trades here, they traded away K, uh, KJ Martin, um, and then also trading away Josh Christopher, Usman Garuba, and Ty Ty Washington. Um, especially Ty Ty Washington, like that's your first round pick from last year. Um, and he, doesn't re- he haven't really had a great opportunity to really do much in Houston last year. Again, they're, they're so log jammed with young talent. Obviously, you have to consolidate at some point. Um, but they really got nothing back for these guys, like a couple of second round picks. So, um, I wasn't a huge fan of those moves in general, but strictly from the signings that they did make, um, I think I think a B plus is, is good, but wish they could have found a way to keep Josh Christopher, KJ, or Ty Ty. Like, obviously, you can't keep everybody, but trading away a first-round pick in Ty Ty Washington after you really don't give him a ton of playing time last year, don't give him a ton of time to develop or really, really even show you what he could do on an NBA floor um, – I'm just not a huge, huge fan of, but um, he's on. He's going to the Hawks now in that same deal with, with Usman Garuba. So uh, potentially he'll get some time to, to back up Trey Young, um, be able to kind of grow and develop into what he projected to. Like, you can't even really gauge him as a player. Like, he still is basically a prospect at this point. because mm-hmm. um, He hasn't really had time to showcase that much on the, on the NBA stage. Yeah. It's a little. It's, I feel like it's just a little bit tough because, like we talked about before, they have so many players and they have so mm-hmm. many young players. It's like it's hard, it's going to be hard for all. Like if they just kept all these guys, it's going to be hard for all of these guys to get the minutes that they're going to need in order to develop. So I just think it was tough. They have a lot of they have a lot of people on this team that just need to to, to develop. They need time. You know what I mean? They need time to make mistakes. So I just think that's part of the reason why they trade away those guys. But. Yeah, it, it, it's always tough because you want a guy to at least show you what he can do before you, like, completely give up on him. But hopefully he can go to a new situation and at least get somewhat of a, a of a chance to prove that he can be a player in the NBA. So, yeah, it's, it's tough. We talked about it. they had a, They had all this money, and they still had all of these young players. So it's going to be interesting to see how they how they delegate the minutes um, for all of these guys so that all of these guys can reach their full potential. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Going to shift over to the East here to a team that had their, again, we're viewing all this stuff by their circumstances, right? The moves that they made were not bad by any means, but they just, it looked like a team that's continuing to tread water and are not going to make any real moves in terms of either going in the rebuilding direction or really trying to contend. They just are staying in that middle ground and they've been there for too many years. And that is the Chicago Bulls who bring in Javon Carter and Torrey Craig on three year and two year deals, respectively. Um, They get Kobe Wright to Kobe White to resign on a a three year deal, $33 million deal. So $11 million a year for Kobe White. I think that's good value. 
Um, but they bring back Vucevic on a three-year, $60 million deal, which, look, 20 M's is, I think, a great great value for Vooch. But, I, like, what are, what is this Bulls team doing? They look exactly the same. They're not going to get any better. They're not going to be worse than they were last year. They'll probably be a playing team again. Yeah. And because of that, like, this has to be like a C minus free agency. Like, if you're not going to make the decision to rebuild or go out and make big splash moves, like, let's just run it back, DeMar, Zach, and Vooch, we already know what this core is going to do. I like, obviously, the Lonzo injury is unfortunate, but that's out of your control now at this point. So just continuing to run it back is not not doing anything for them. I think the Chicago Bulls are in the worst position in basketball. They're mm-hmm. the the worst in the worst position to be out of every single team in basketball. Even teams that are worse than them have young players and have somewhat of a future. The Chicago Bulls are making moves as if, as if they are a contender and they're a playing team. Like you're signing these are I like the players that they signed. You know what yeah. I mean? Like I, I I like the deals that they signed, but I don't like them for this team because what are you running back? Like you're running a team back that was a playing team. Like, what are you running back? I don't get that. Like, we've always talked about those middling teams that are just, you're not good enough to contend. You're not good enough to even compete. Like, you're not good enough to even be like a, this team possibly could make a run. Like, you're not even one of those teams. But you're also yeah. not a team that's rebuilding, that has young draft picks. Uh, they specifically picks. said they're not going to, like, they're looking to not rebuild. For why? What are you running back? Nothing is going to change. Like, your guys aren't going to get better. Like just drastically get better. You have Demar Derozan, who who he is, he is what he is at this point. Exactly. I mean, he is what he is. Vucevic, he is what he is. You're not gonna like nothing's gonna change. Like, do you, you want to know what I really think it is? What they saw that they were up on the Miami Heat with three minutes, whatever left to go in that second playing game. <laughs> they can't get it done, and the Heat go to the finals. So, so they in think their they're... mind, right? They're just like. <laughs> We were right there. That could have been us, which, like, yeah, no. it, it also could have been Thunder, right, in the West. But, like, would the Thunder have gone that far? No. Right. Like, the Heat players stepped up to another level. Obviously, Jimmy going nuclear there in the first round. And I, I really think more than anything, this playoffs was such a moment for Bam to really solidify himself. Continuing to showcase how great of a defender he is, but he really stepped up consistently on the offensive end in every single playoff series. So with that, like, I don't see that type of transformation out of this Bulls roster. Like, we're not about to go into the playoffs and, oh, my gosh, Vucevic is, like, protecting the rim like crazy. Right. Like, he's this great interior presence. Like, that's not going to – it's not going to happen. That's still going to be a big hole for this roster in general. Like, I don't know. I just I don't see them having it made the kind of run that Miami did. But I think because they were in that position, that's their mindset of, like, we were right there. Like, we lose Pat Bev. We bring in another scrappy guard like Javon Carter, who, to me, I think is a better defender than Pat Bev. Um, and, you know, you get Kobe White on a good deal. You get Fuchovic on great value. Like, cool, let's run it back and let's let's do it. But I just don't think that that like that is not enough, um, yeah. To to me for this team to really do anything different, like realistically, like let's replace Miami this past year with Chicago first round. Does that Chicago team beat Milwaukee? Period. Yeah, it doesn't even wax. have to, doesn't even have to be in the five games. No, no, they, they because we wax. said we said going into it off rip. Even if everybody's healthy, it's going to be a tough series for Milwaukee because Miami is going to play physical, gritty. We understand how supposed are coaches. We know how they've matched it before. We know how they've done Milwaukee in the past, putting up that wall against Giannis, right? Like they have this, the schematics for it. They have the personnel for it. What was Chicago going to do against Giannis? They have no answer. They have no answer. Didn't they lose to Milwaukee, was it two years ago, a year ago? Yeah, they lost, like in the first they, lost in, they lost and they got gentlemen swept. I'm pretty sure it was a yeah, five-game like, series. And that's the same team. Like, nothing is going to change. You guys are the same team. Like, you guys keep running it back as if, like, we're so close. We were so close. We were almost there. We're just a little bit away. Like, no. So, 
Right. I, I, I just don't get it. I, I'll grade them. I'll grade them a C minus. I really want to grade them like a D, but I actually like the moves themselves, like team aside. I like the moves themselves and all of the players in the moves. So yeah. the players alone bumps it up to a C minus. But realistically, for this team, it was a horrible free agency. Yeah, they uh, you have to think about it not just like the talent that you put together, but right if you want to make contention in the East, like you have to think about the team that you have to beat to get to the Eastern Conference Finals. Eventually, mm-hmm. you're gonna have to play a team like Milwaukee or Philly. Who on your roster could handle Giannis or Embiid? Nobody. Like, there's no answers there. Like your construction is not a team that's gonna get through the East. Mm-hmm. So like because of that, I cannot. Like I said, I like the players a lot in a vacuum. I think they got great value. Kobe White on 11 years, great. Vucevic on, tw- on or not 11 years, 11 million, great. Vucevic on 20 million dollars a year. We're seeing what some Jeremy Grant just got 32 M's. Right. 20 million for Vucevic seemed like a steal. But I'm not a huge Vucevic fan in the first place. He's <laughs> not doing much for me on this roster. He is one of the worst defensive bigs in the league, in my opinion. So, like, they just are keeping the same problems there. So, C, C minus, really, like, it's just not a not a great free agency there for Chicago. Um, going to another team in the East here, I want to talk about the Indiana Pacers, um, who went out and got Bruce Brown, which is a fit that I absolutely – love for indiana and bruce brown got himself a bag two-year 45 million dollar deal you know michael malone was saying that brucey what do you say brucey brucey b ain't going anywhere brucey b brucey b ain't going nowhere yeah brucey b's up out of there (laughs) (laughs) he got himself a bag he's making 20 plus million dollars a year you know over 22 m's a year so shout out to bruce is well deserved i think he's underrated with his time in Brooklyn. I think he showcased why he's a very, very good player, especially for teams that are looking to contend um, with the championship run there in Denver, being a critical part of their rotation. So I think it's a huge pickup for the Pacers. Um, So I I really like that there for them. In addition to they sign and lock up Tyrese to his rookie max extension. Um, So that's a a five-year um, potentially could be worth up to $260 million. I think that's dependent on him making an all NBA team here over the next couple of seasons. Um, and then lastly, they also bring in Obi Toppin on a trade with the Knicks um, for two second round picks. So you give up two seconds, you get Obi Toppin, you bring in Bruce Brown, you re sign Tyrese. Um, this is a like a B plus free agency window for the Pacers team. We said they really were just missing a four slot. They tried Jalen Smith and you know, they had O'Shea Brissett. Nothing was really solidifying itself there. You bring in Obi Toppin to pair up with Tyrese, arguably one of the best passers in the league. That alone is like a great fit. You add Bruce Brown to that mix. You still have, you know, Buddy Hill, ben- Benedict Mathurin is only going to continue to get better. Um, this Pacers team is going to be one of my favorite teams to watch this upcoming season. Um, like I'm very excited for what they've put together. Um, I think they could become a legitimate playoff team this year. I'm not saying that they're going to be a top three seed or anything, but you know, maybe a six seed, potentially maybe like a five seed. Um, I think they're a playoff lock. Like I think they're yeah. locked to make the playoffs. Yeah, and I think that they should. They're not going to necessarily be a contender right now, but they're not going to be any type of slouch or pushover going forward. So um, I think this, this is a start for them to really make that leap now into like, we're here, we're in the East, like we're going to be a team to look out for. So yeah, I give them a B plus. Yeah. Um, I think I give them the a minus. Um, I like the, obviously I like the Bruce Brown signing. Um, people were saying that they feel like he got a lot of money, but I think he earned a lot of money. Like I think yeah. Nuggets don't win the championship without Bruce Brown. Like I think he, he, he was closing games for them. Yes. Like Bruce Brown played very, very well. That's when the Lakers talk about looking at him. I'm like, do we even have enough money? Like for what he's actually worth? No, we could not pay. We couldn't pay him what he deserved. So I'm, I'm actually, I'm glad, I'm glad he went and go got a bag somewhere. And the second year, isn't that a team option? In the second year, like um, I'm, I'm pretty sure they have a team option. So even if worst case scenario, 
they don't really want to bring him back, they can opt out of it. I'm pre. I'm think it's a team option. If not, um, yeah, I'm still yeah. okay. So yeah, even bro, even if if anything, if it looks like a huge overpay, which I don't think it will, I think he'll still play well. Yeah, they can just opt out of the contract in the second year. So that, that I'm not worried about that at all. Tyrese deserved the five year extension, hundred percent, and I really really like them getting Obi Toppin. I feel like um, Julius Randle was was not allowing him to to. D- develop not even develop but just get the minutes that i feel like he deserved basically right. i feel like he's a really good player he just needed the opportunity and that's why i was always on the board on board with trading julius randall with the knicks and just let obi Toppin slide into that four spot but mm-hmm. i mean this works out obi Toppin goes to a young pacers team he fits that timeline him with tyrese halliburton i feel like it's gonna be a really really good fit uh one of the best like pastors and facilitators in basketball yeah this pacers team it looks really really good and they look like like you said this is the the starting point of building something that in a couple years they might be true contenders so i'm all for it like i said i think i said a minus i think that i think this was a really good free agency period for them yeah no i i agree completely they uh the obi topping deal just is crazy like how two if two seconds is all it took i'd imagine there should have been so many more teams calling for obi topping right um, like this is a lottery guy who just in the minute like times when he got actual minutes produced very well. If you look at like his per 36 stats was always performing really, really highly. Um, so he just never really got, like you said, the minutes playing there behind, you know, all NBA guy and Julius Randle. But um, yeah, so look, they they solidify that that need there at the four spot. He'll be playing next to Miles Turner. So that spacing on those backboard cuts is gonna be Oh my gosh, these lobs are gonna be crazy. Lobs this team are gonna is gonna be, crazy. be fun. This team yeah. is gonna be real fun. Lots of spacing, lots of shooting, athleticism. Now I'm bringing in Obi Toppin and Benedict Mathurin as well, who can definitely punch it at the rim. So, look, that's about to be one of my league pass teams for for sure. Um, keeping it in the East, going on to another team that made a lot of a lot of moves, especially in retaining guys. We're gonna go to the Milwaukee Bucks, who not only bring back Chris Middleton on a three-year deal um, worth $102 million, which is less than his player option. Um, and I believe his deal also has a player option as well. And it's, I think it's a, a two and one. Um, they bring back Brooke Lopez as well on a two-year $48 million deal. So Brooke getting $24 million a year to stay in Milwaukee. Um, additionally, they re-signed Jay Crowder as well. And then they bring in Malik Beasley and Robin Lopez as well. So both the Lopez brothers there in Milwaukee. Um, I think that this was a very, very solid free agency for um, a Milwaukee team that's looking to come in with a new coach um, and you know look to reassert themselves after what was in a very embarrassing playoffs last year. Uh, so I give this a, a solid B, um, like bringing your guys back on – what I think is great value, like I said, Chris Middleton's deal was less than what his player option would have been uh, this past season. Um, Brooke Lopez on $24 million is a steal. Dude is a defensive player of the year candidate, um, right? We just saw Dylan Brooks got 20. So for four more million dollars a year, you got somebody that's depoy eligible. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you bring in Malik Beasley, who, again, didn't have the greatest of stints with the Lakers, but obviously we know he can be as a shooter. So – if he can come and bring that and find a way to crack the rotation there in Milwaukee, you know, obviously pairing any amount of shooters around Giannis is the way that you want to go there. So I think this is a very good for agency, solid B um, for Milwaukee here. Yeah, I'll give him a B plus just because I like the, the value that they got bringing these guys back. So, mm-hmm. but yeah, like they, there are contenders. They didn't need to do anything crazy. Um, obviously, like you said, they, they went out in embarrassing fashion, but you can say if you're being optimistic, Giannis was hurt those first two games. Granted, they did lose when he came back, or first three, was it two or three games, one of the two, but they did lose when he came back. But, I mean, if you're being optimistic, you could say that if he was here the whole time, the series might be completely different. So, um, they didn't need to do anything drastic. Bring, book, bringing book, Brooke Lopez back was huge, because I felt like that would have hurt them a lot if they would have lost him like, to a team like the Rockets. So, bringing him back was huge. Adding in guys like Malik Beasley, Robin Lopez, just solid role players, definitely solid role players. Um, if Malik Beasley can find a shot again, that could be a really good pickup for them because he, I feel like he was a really good shooter before he got traded to the, the Lakers. And even 
like in the first like I'd say a couple games with the Lakers, he was playing well. Like he was in the starting rotation. He was hitting some threes. Like I really, I don't really know what happened, but if he can get that confidence back and he can become like a knockdown shooter like he was, that could be a huge picker for them. Jay Crowder is on a million different teams, but he's been a quality role player on pretty much all of them. So yep. I, I like what they did. Definitely like B to B plus. Yeah, yeah. I think that them getting Chris and Brooke back, especially with all the rumors of Brooke potentially going to Houston. Um, being able to get him back on a, a $24 million a year deal, um, I think that's a, a big win for Milwaukee there and signifies that they're looking to keep this core together um, and try to push for another ring. Um, I want to go ahead and shift over now to a team that I think had a underwhelming for agency window, especially given their circumstances. And to me, that is the Golden State Warriors. Um Look, again, not necessarily a team with a ton of cap space, but we just saw what Phoenix and the Lakers did without a ton of cap space in terms of filling out their rosters. And all they've really done, obviously, again, is trade Jordan Poole over to the Wizards. So they bring in Chris Paul. They bring in Corey Joseph on a, a one-year deal, and then they, uh, they bring Draymond back on that four-year, $100 million deal. Um, they lose Dante DiVincenzo, who was a huge part of their rotation, um, to the Knicks, um, who, who goes and joins his, his Villanova brethren um, and Josh Hart and Jalen Brunson um, over there in New York. So I'm going to give them like a C minus, not necessarily just because of the moves they made, but more so the lack thereof. Um, like, they haven't done a ton to address some of their needs. Like I said, they're losing guys in their rotation, like Dante, Dante DiVincenzo, um, that like Corey Joseph is not going to be able to fill that exact same kind of void. Again, you lose Jordan Poole and you're bringing back an older guy in Chris Paul. Um, again, you keep Draymond. Like, what's going to be the deal with Kaminga? Like, I still have so many question marks with this team, and not a lot of – really none of them got addressed – to me in, in this free agency period. So C minus, maybe a D plus, to be honest with you. Like they've, there's gotta be more there for them. Yeah. Um, if you ever see me duck off to the side, I'm a little sick right now. So I'm good. over here blowing my nose, sneezing, coughing, a whole lot of stuff. But nah, um, I just think the Warriors, it was very, very underwhelming. I mean, you brought back Draymond. It's a plus, I guess. You're not a contending team without Draymond. He's, you're pretty much your whole defense. So, but they didn't really, like you said, they didn't do anything. Like, there's a lot of guys that went for some pretty cheap deals that I feel like could have helped the Warriors out if they chose to go in that route. But, I mean, it, it was so bad. I, I got to the point on Twitter, I'm seeing Corey Joseph highlights of Warriors for insane. Bro, like, from, the jump was from the Obama administration. I'm like, why <laughs> like, <are> we... <laughs> I'm like, bro, what is this? You show me Corey Joseph highlights? That's what we're getting excited for now. But. You know, they, did, they didn't do anything. The main part, like you said, they didn't address any of the needs that they have. Right. Like, they're still small. They still don't have a lot of forwards on that team. Nobody really in the front court. Um, they're really banging on this coming, this CP3 unlocking Kaminga, like Jay, like uh, Draymond Green said. Hold on. He was saying that Aiton was looking like a bust before CP3 got there. Yeah, no, that was not true. His stats did not like. I, I again, I still heavily stand by. I think CP3 on the floor made Aiton significantly better. But mm -hmm. his stats before CP3 got there was not like a bust. Like no, and like they weren't like the stats weren't drastically different. They were better, but like he was putting up like 14 or 15 a night with like 10 rebounds. Like it's not a bust by any means. Like and like. What is what is Kaminga and, and CP3 going to do? Like, is that going to be like their pick and roll tandem? Like, that's yeah. why I don't really get that because he's not a big man. Like, they're not a team that runs a lot of standard pick and rolls. Like, it's not the way that Kerr runs that offense. Mm -hmm. Even though I do feel like just off the way that they're talking, I think that that you could see you could see it a little bit more this year, just because a lot of the stuff that they're saying, talking about needing to shift. Draymond talked about they just needed to be more versatile, basically. Mm -hmm. um, they needed to be able to score in other in other ways. So I think the coming up this season, you'll see a little bit more pick and rolls. But again, it's like, who are you running these pick and rolls with? Like Looney, and then what else? I'm like, assuming it has to be Kaminga if you're gonna keep him right. Like, I mean, I guess, but is that really how you're gonna best utilize Kaminga and and like having him be a roller in a pick and roll? 
I don't know. I don't. It, I don't know. It, it doesn't make sense. I guess it's just something that we're gonna have to see. But um, yeah. Just going back to their free agency, they didn't really make a lot. They didn't make any moves that like impressed me at all. And I feel like they just weren't active. Like like I said, there's a lot of guys who went for some cheap deals that could have helped the Warriors out. So, and again, we I don't, we both don't really like the Chris Paul trade that much. So if we're including that in there, I give them about like a D plus. I get uh, yeah. Eh. Yeah, nah, I give them a D plus. I'm saying for them at the D plus because yeah. to me their roster got worse. Right, Iggy retires, which like mm-hmm. not from a playing perspective, but you lose that you know, veteran locker presence room. in the locker room. Right, um, you lose even Chenzo. Like I said, critical part of their rotation. Corey Joseph is not filling that void. Um, you bring Draymond back, but then you ship out Jordan Poole for Chris Paul, which I think Jordan Poole would have been the better option to keep just because of the youth, what he could continue to develop into. Like, I feel like they just gave up on him very quickly after, you know, a very deservedly so bad playoffs. But, um, like, he was critical to them winning the year prior. Like, I just feel like they gave up on him way too early there. Um, And they still have so many front court issues. Like, again, you only have Looney when the Western Conference champion was just run through – by a seven foot legit center. You biggest player on the team is Kavon Looney. And you're now you're linked to also guys like Dario Sarge, potentially now that we're later under free agency. None of these are moving the needle for me. None of that is moving the needle for me if I'm a Warriors fan. So yeah, uh, D plus, there's gotta be more. Gotta be more if you're Golden State. Is Kavon Looney, hold on. He, he's like Kavon six, Looney nine, is six, six nine. Ten. Yeah. <laughs> That is their biggest guy on the team. Yeah, they have no seven footers. They don't even have anyone six ten and up on the team. Yeah. Wow, that's is. Are they the only team in the league with no one six ten and up? Like I, I think I seen that tweet and I thought it was a joke. Uh, that's possible. The they might. Heat, be... Well, because how how tall is um Cody Zeller though? Oh, he was yeah. he's like seven, he's like six eleven seven foot. I was gonna say yeah, how tall is Yurt seven? But I guess I forgot about Zeller too. Yeah, I'm about um, to say they they might be the only team in the league. They're definitely one of the only contending team in the league with no one with uh no one over six ten. Yeah, we're in a league where the best players in the world besides Steph are Jokic, Giannis. Like, that's crazy. Right. That's like wild. we said, you can't. You can't just look at the roster in a vacuum. You got to think about the teams that you would have to go through if you wanted to actually win a championship. Before we even get to who comes out of the East, how are you going to stop Jokic? Right. It's just, it just has to be how teams are constructed, right? They are the reigning champion. They're the reigning Western Conference champion. Like, what can this team do right now to stop Jokic other than just try to outscore Denver? Yeah. I really think nothing. I don't think they have any good answers there. Um, and so barring different trade options, like what's left for them in free agency is like scraps, like you're picking meat off the bone if you're, if you're Golden State. And that's not going to cut it for a team that's this late into their championship window with the age of their stars. Um, and potentially, obviously, again, with some of the, the injury history of some of the players on that team now with, you know, Clay and then CP3 now as well. Like, it's got to be now. Like, do you, there's no reason. Like, you, you have to have a better free agency, like, point blank. So, we said going into it, like, Bob Myers leaving, you bring in Mike Dunleavy to be the new GM. Like, you're going to have a, a lot on your plate. You're not impressing me. Not impressing me at all. Anything, no. any, no. everything that you've done so far, I've had like question marks about. So, hey man, well, I guess we'll see this season. Like, what, do you consider them contenders? Like, at like all? Like, serious title contenders? Yeah. It's hard to say no because you have Steph and Clay and Draymond, like, they've already done four. But, like, if I'm being real, when I look out west as of today, let me, let me, this would be a good exercise. Let me pull up all the teams in the Western Conference right now. These are all the teams that I think are better than Golden State as of today. 
Denver, 100%. Yep. Suns, 100%. Yep. Lakers, 100%. Mm-hmm. So that's three right there. The Clippers? Yes. If healthy. Say, so if healthy, I would say yeah. Um, bro, if healthy, New Orleans? That's a, I would yeah. say probably too. This, they brought Herb Jones back on a four-year deal. Um, I don't know what the whole Zion situation is, but look, if Zion comes back healthy, I would take that Pelicans team over this Warriors team. The Kings, like... They went seven with them. Right, like... I, like, that off alone, like, we're, we're at, like, what, six, seven teams deep. Mm-hmm. And it's just in the West... We go to the east, off rip, Bucks, Celtics, Sixers. Like, mm, you're like talking Key? 10th best. Right. And these, this is like at best. You're talking like maybe the 10th best team. It can't be a contender. Yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's tough when you think about it because you really you don't want to say they're not a contender when they have Steph Curry who's playing great basketball, but like. Clay's not. Draymond, he's Draymond's still Draymond, but he's not he's still not prime Draymond. And yeah, lost a lot of pieces and gotten worse. Tell me if I'm tripping here, because I was thinking about this the other day. Jordan Poole being so unplayable in the playoffs again. He had the turnovers. He was shooting poorly. Bad at defense, right? Like he just looked lost on the court. Probably a big reason why he got traded. Clay Thompson, outside of those spot games there, for a large portion of this playoffs, especially those last couple games in that Lakers series, he shot poorly. Definitely not the defender he used to be. And again, that's not a fault to him. He just throws the reality. You tore your ACL and your Achilles. Like, mm-hmm. you just aren't the, the two way player that he kind of become earlier in his career. Like, Jordan Poole catches a lot of the slack for being so bad in the playoffs. Clay did not have a good playoffs, and especially those last, what, three or four games against L.A., like, bad, like, shooting, like, 25% from three. No, he was horrible. Clay hasn't had to pass two, even when they won the championship, I don't think Clay was good. He, the, Andrew Wiggins was the second best player on that team, like, that Easily. Series. Easily, and it was not close. Like, Clay was not good, like... Clay has not, and like he's said, not to the standards of what Clay Thompson had been in the past. You can't win a championship with Clay Thompson as your second best player now. You can't. Like, I don't think that's that ship has sailed. Like Andrew, uh, Steph was just great in that playoff in that playoff run where they won the championship. Andrew Wiggins was great. Looney was great. Like they had a good team. Clay was not the second best player, and Clay has not been good these past two playoffs. Like honestly, it's just I'm telling you, if he if his name was not Clay Thompson, they would not be looking to give him no extension or bring him back, or that could have been a piece that they used to really upgrade their team. But because he's Clay Thompson, because they're the Splash Brothers, because it is the right it is the right thing emotionally to do to keep that core together and just let them be warriors for life, they're never gonna rip that band aid off. But like if if we're just being emotionless Clay, who isn't he on an expiring contract? Like, isn't this is the last year of his deal? That could be a piece to move to really get pieces back, but you're not going to do that because he's Clay Thompson, right? Yeah, but that's just something I was thinking about because I've seen Warriors fans be like, "Look, the timeline. Like, there's only should be one timeline, right? Like, forget the double timeline. We have Steph. We need to maximize this timeline." So if we had to get rid of Jordan Poole to, to maximize that, then so be it. But if part of that is because you feel like he was so bad in this last playoff series, like, let's just be real with ourselves. Clay has not been what Clay used to be. And if that's partly due to the injuries, like, that's just unfortunate. But that's just the reality, right? Like, and I'm always going to root for Clay. Like, I think we both will, like, I think he's probably at worst like what a top three shooter ever mm-hmm. top five i guess maybe top five really at worst but top, i say top three yeah like he 
might have the best shooting form ever. Um, so I'm always going to root for him in that aspect, but like, I don't want to just sit here and Jordan Poole catches all the slack for these playoff performances when Clay has not been up to up to par either. And I feel like that just kind of gets kicked under the rug because Jordan Poole just catches all this all the flack for it. Because like, granted, it looked worse. The turnovers looked bad. The, like, I was just about to say the turnovers are probably what's what what really makes it look so bad. Clay's mm-hmm. missing shots, but you still when you see the shot go up, you you feel like it's gonna go in. It got to the point with Jordan Poole like. When he had the ball, you were, like, closing your eyes, thinking right. that, like, something bad was going to happen. Right. Um, yeah, that that's just what I've been thinking about because, I don't know. I feel like he getting scapegoated a little bit too much by by the media and Warriors fans as a whole. Um, yeah. You got any other teams that you really want to touch on? I feel like we covered most of the the major moves here in free agency. Um. No, nobody else really made, like, huge moves. I mean. I guess we could shout out, you know, Desmond Bain got him, got him the max. So did right. uh, Anthony, Anthony Edwards. Edwards as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so LaMelo. Those dudes. Yep, LaMelo got the max too. Um, so all the yeah. all the guys from those past couple of draft class, classes now being eligible for their, their max deals. Um, all of them are opting in. Um, so this would have been the time that good, Wiseman yeah. could have got his, but you know, Warriors. That's an, since we're talking about the Warriors, <laughs> Ant got his, Lamelo got his. That number two spot, it's a lot of looking too good. Hey, he's looking. They they put out some pictures of him and uh, some practices with Detroit. They got him slimmed down. Apparently, the Warriors are trying to get him to put on weight. They had him up at like two sixty, two sixty five. I read coming off of the meniscus injury, and it just like it was not working. So they got him slimmed down in Detroit. He's looking, look good, look lean. He looks like he's a. Uh, I'm very interested to see what, what Detroit does with their front court between Isaiah Stewart, um, Jalen Duran, and um, and uh, James Wiseman. Because there was periods towards the end of the year there where, where they were giving Wiseman the start. Um, I think Jalen Duran is probably the better option there. Um, like just from what I've seen from him, I think that he is a legitimate, really good center, good green setter, good roller, rim protector. Like again, we talked about what the modern day center is seeming like it's about to turn into. Like I think he checks all those boxes well. Um, so I'm, I'm interested to see with what the the Pistons do there, like long term. Like because eventually you're gonna have to move off of probably two of those guys. I was about to say one, if not two. Yeah. So. But, and I, yeah. all of them have some type of value. Like Isaiah Stewart, I know has some value between if you can get Wiseman's value up a little bit, maybe you move him. Like who knows? But um, worst yeah. case scenario, Isaiah Stewart, you could trade him to like the UFC because he was, you know, what I'm saying he'd be a good fighter. <laughs> but was that this past season too? No, nah, I think that was a lot. I okay. think that was a year ago. I just that every time I think Isaiah Stewart, that is the first thing that comes to mind, bro. He was he, trying to rip LeBron head off. No, but <laughs> I've never seen somebody run through that many. He was literally like throwing coaches and players left, right, stiff arm, truck stick, like Face nobody could have held him back. Nah, it looked crazy. It definitely yeah. looked crazy. That was funny. But side note, listen, man, Saturday's pod. So you saw Wimby's playing on Friday. Saturday's Get ready for – yeah, let me pull up the, the Summer League real quick before we head on out of here. Um, Summer League is starting on Friday. Oh, I'm so excited, bro. I was, I was excited watching the, the California Summer League Facts. and the Utah Summer League. <clears throat> and we don't even have all the stars and the big names there. So, first game, tipping it off, you got Miami and the Lakers. Um, and then following that – San Antonio versus Charlotte. Now, we saw the first game from Brandon Miller. Um, definitely struggled from the field. They got – oh, no, this was uh, – hold on. This is this is the wrong schedule. That was yesterday – or Monday schedule. Let me pull up Vegas. Okay, here go to Vegas schedule. It is still Charlotte and San Antonio on the first day. Um, yeah, they got throttled. <laughs> they got throttled. Dominic Barlow and uh, Julian Champagny absolutely ran them off the court. Brandon Miller definitely struggled from the field, struggled to find his touch around the rim. He kind of hit a couple of shots there, mm-hmm. um, what was basically garbage time. So, look, that San Antonio team is basically going to be exactly the same with the addition of Wemby. And I think – I don't even know if Sohan is playing somewhere there. i got to double-check their roster. But he wasn't he playing is, that other game. 
Right. If he is, then it, you're adding Wemby and Sohan. Like, we find yeah. out they got a summer league super team. <laughs> Bro, you know who really has a summer league super team? OKC. The, the Thunder. Yeah, I, because they shouldn't. Them boys should not be playing. Jalen Williams should He's not too be good. playing. He's he way looks too like good. Le, he looks like LeBron out there, but he should not be playing. Chet, I understand why he's playing. Yeah, but he's also too good to be playing this. Like, yeah. Um, and you know who else? Look, just in this this first couple of days of summer league that has passed, Keegan Murray. He, he looked looks really good. Great. And for a team like Sacramento, who was could have potentially been one of the suitors for Kyle Kuzma. And again, he ended up going back to Washington. Like, you saved the money. Keegan Murray develops a couple years. Like, I think he has a ways to go in terms of the, the defense and rebounding. But offensively, like, for what we saw from him in the playoffs and then just how he came out to start the summer league game, I think he had a 30 ball. Mm-hmm. Um, like, he could be a very, very good solid piece to that Kings team. They brought back Sabonis on his his extension. Like, you still have De'Aaron. You add Keegan Murray, so continues to develop in there. He could be – that could be a better option for them long-term than having one out and tried to get Kuzma. Um, That's Because then you, you probably hinder Keegan's development a little yeah. bit. So, yeah. I like that for them a ton. Makes sense. Yeah, I like – I listen. The fact that he was already hooping and playing huge minutes in a, a playoff game or a playoff series – in his rookie year against the defending champions, that should say enough right there. And the fact that he's only going to get better, man, he could be he could be a really good player. Yeah. So, look on Saturday, we're going to give our probably first, almost probably overreactions to those first games in summer league. It's going to be um, so hard not to like, bro. I'm watching the Brandon Miller game. I'm like, hey, Scoot should have <laughs> went number two. Like, bro, <laughs> it's so hard not to overreact. And I yeah. know, like I know you shouldn't, but it's just hard, bro. It's yeah. hard, man. But. It's going to be fun. I'm going to be locked in. Yeah, I'm just, look, this is, what, 13, two, almost two weeks of summer league. I'm locked in every single day, at least until we get, like, the bigger names start sitting out, which mm-hmm. happens every summer league. And once that starts to happen, then maybe I've seen enough because then it's like we're just watching G League guys. But right. um, well, I'm – Itching for hoops, itching for, for some NBA hoops. So um, I'm excited. Be sure to tune into Summer League on Friday. But that is going to do it for another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. If you made it this far into the episode, we appreciate you. If you're on YouTube, go ahead and like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. Um, even if you're on YouTube, go over to the audio platforms too. Go ahead and leave a five star review and pre download the episode. Like I said, we appreciate all support. We'll be back again on Saturday. Um, to do the uh, the preview for Summer League and give our, our initial reactions to that first day of games that starts on Friday. So so be tuned in for that because it's going to be exciting. It's going to yes, be exciting. Sir. We're going to see the 7-5 phenom take the court for the first time. I can't wait, bro. Uh, but, yeah, I, I'm Billy. That's Dame. And we out. Peace. Yes, sir.